struck off from the rude path he had been following into that trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all of the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of, of the fox. Night found him leg-weary, with the hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark. Even if he had the strength, his need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I have played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and, taking care to leave not the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crotch and, stretching out on one of the broad limbs after a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so zealous a hunter as General Zarov could not trace him there. He told himself, only the devil himself could follow that complicated trail to the jungle after dark. But perhaps the general was a devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Ransford, although the silence of a dead world was on the jungle. Toward morning, when a dingy gray was varnishing the sky, the cry of some startled bird focused Ransford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Ransford had come. He flattened himself down on the limb and, through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. That which was approaching was a man. It was General Zarov. He made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused, almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees, and studied the ground. Ransford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw the general's right hand that held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times, as if he were puzzled. Then he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent, incense-like smoke floated up to Ransford's nostrils. Ransford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Ransford froze there, every muscle tense for a spring, but the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Ransford lay. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away, back along the trail he had come. The swish of underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. The pent-up air burst hotly from Ransford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny power. Only by the merest chance had the Kosick failed to see his query. Ransford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole body. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Ransford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was evident as the sun that had by now pushed through the morning mist. The general was playing with them. The general was saving him for another day's sport. The Kosick was the, the cat. He was the mouse. Then it was that Ransford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. 
pursuer was coming, he heard the padding sound of feet on the soft earth, and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Ransford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along, foot by foot. Ransford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived here in a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry loud with joy for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leaped up from his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing with an electronic torch in his hand. You've done well, Ransford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again you score. I think, Mr. Ransford, I'll see what you can do against my old pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for the most amusing evening. At daybreak, Ransford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by a sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the bang of a pack of hounds. Ransford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment he stood there, thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him, and, tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The bang of the sounds of the hounds drew near then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. On a ridge, Ransford climbed a tree, down a watercourse, not a quarter of a mile away. He could see the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Sarov. Just ahead of him, Ransford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed to pull forward by some unseen force. Ransford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in his leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife. With the blade pointing down the trail, with a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Ransford knew now how an animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The baying of the hounds stopped abruptly and Ransford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shined excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped. But the hope that was in Ransford's brain when he climbed died. For he saw in the shallow valley that General Zarov was still on his feet, but Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. Ransford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 he panted. As he dashed along, a blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. 
curtains of the bed was standing there. Ransford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam, said Ransford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Ransford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Sarov. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep. 